Alright, so I just wanted to make a quick video going over all the information that I wish I had had when I built this. A Mutable Instruments Elements module. Since Mutable Instruments doesn't make any documentation or guides for this sort of stuff, it's very much a do-it-yourself sort of thing. And that means that there's a lot of information that is useful to have, but you just don't really find in any one consolidated place. So I'm just making a video going over all the things that I wish I had known, just in no particular order. So the first thing, and probably the most annoying thing, is order more than you need of the components. Just order, like, just take whatever number you have, bump it up by like three or so for most of the passives and everything, like the, the capacitors and resistors and stuff. Because if you forget something, or you drop one of those tiny little SMD resistors, you're gonna curse yourself when you have to wait, you know, four days to continue working on it because, you know, you didn't have an extra one. And that, I know that because that happened to me. So order more components. And to go along with that, make sure that your components list is correct. Now, mine wasn't, and I skipped over one of the largest number of things. I missed the 22 capacitors, uh, I think 10 microfarad or something that I needed for the module. And I had to wait again after I realized that I was missing these components. And that goes along with the method by which you want to assemble this is kind of a step-by-step -step process where you start out with the power section, you solder those components first, test it out, plug it in, see if you have the right voltages, then solder the microprocessor, the STM32, go from there, program that, make sure that that works, and then solder all of your codecs, your um, multiplexers, your all your all the other stuff, and especially the jacks, since you can't remove those if, well, you can, but it's difficult um, after you've put them in. So that's just a general like approach to it, since there isn't much of a, you know, laid out plan for assembly that sort of thing. And when you're assembling, you want to make sure that you're following the schematic. The you can get the um, schematic as an eagle file, um, just downloaded straight from the GitHub. And what you want to do is, when you sit down to assemble, have that file open on your computer. Eagle is free. There's no reason not to. Just open it up and look at the file, look at your parts list, and make sure that you're placing stuff in the right spot. And one thing that isn't super obvious, or maybe it wasn't obvious to me, is when you're placing components on the board, especially the SMD resistors and capacitors, they go across white lines on the board. And you should not be placing any components that don't go over white lines on the board. And jumping back to the component selection, this one's really important, make sure you're getting linear potentiometers. Now when I ordered, I just assumed that A was the standard. I ordered part number A, 10K, a was the part number that I ordered from uh, Module Addict, and that's not linear. That's log, logarithmic scale for audio. Not what you want. This is a digital microcontroller-based module, and it needs linear potentiometers for the uh, attenuverters and the input knobs. And luckily, I caught it before I soldered anything in, and this is also why you solder in stages. and what you want to do is when you're ordering, look at your part numbers. You want to order B. B is generally for linear potentiometers. And you can get some of the potentiometers from Mouser. However, the potentiometers for the attenuverters that you can get from Mouser are a little bit shorter than the ones that um, are recommended by the parts list, and they also don't have white paint on the marking. However, you can get ones with center detents if that's something that you want. Um, that's what I used just because I could order it from Mouser instead of from somewhere like Thonk, which is uh, in the UK and means that I'd be waiting a lot longer for shipping. As for where to buy your components, I would recommend Module Addict for the PCB, the potentiometers, and possibly the knobs if you like the selection that they have, as well as jacks. Um, those are the things that are best to get from Modulatic because you won't be able to find them on a place like Mouser. And as for the rest of the components, I'd recommend getting them from Mouser since you can get 
pretty quick shipping, um, at least where I live. It's fairly fast, and you get good prices for ordering more of things, and generally they're a good service, especially since they have a bill of materials tool where you can basically load in someone else's project of all the components that you need and just order a whole set of them, just, just like that. And I'll put a link down below to a components list that I've checked over that I use to assemble my module, and I know that it's complete, at least for the version that I have, um, which is version 2. Um, I don't know if there are any version 1 PCBs still floating around. Um, you can get some of your components from a place like Thonk, um, maybe like the knobs and stuff, because Thonk has the Rogan-style soft-touch knobs that like Mutable Instruments uses. However, I went for knobs from Mouser. That didn't necessarily end up so great for me because I ended up with knobs that have the pointer on the wrong side because the because I didn't bother checking. The pointer is on the opposite side of the flatted D shaft that the potentiometers use. So it's inverted, which is usable for now. I might replace them in the future, just something to watch out for if you care about that. And as for Thonk, as I said before, they're a UK-based company and you will pay for shipping and like import duties and stuff, as well as waiting a little bit longer for your parts to arrive if you're impatient like me, which is why I didn't order anything from there yet. Okay, so the firmware is probably the most difficult part or this, the part that most people seem to have issue with when working on this. And I kind of tried a couple of things and I ended up with something that actually worked out pretty well. What I started out with is I used the STM32, like came it came from a uh, program, came from STM Microelectronics. Um, and it was their program for uploading pre-compiled hex files. And I thought, I won't bother with compiling it myself, I'll just find some hex files that some that someone has already compiled together and just use those and upload those. And that's what I did at first. And that was in the earlier stage where I had not started everything else, hadn't started the LEDs, switches or anything. And it uploaded, but once I got everything assembled and I plugged it in, didn't light up, didn't make any sound. So maybe I was doing it wrong because I think there are two hex files and I wasn't able to figure out how to upload both at the same time. That's up for you to figure out if you can figure out a way to do it. I will add that in the video description or make another short addendum to this video. But I would personally not bother with that because I actually figured out that the best way to do it is don't bother with the pre-compiled hex files. Don't bother with trying to compile it on a Windows computer, which people have had significant trouble with as far as I've seen. I didn't even bother with that because of trouble that I'd seen. What I did was I got a fresh install of Linux Mint on an external hard drive, completely new, built the Vagrant development environment. I had a few, I had a few snags with that, but nothing extreme. Just built the Vagrant development environment from Mutable Instruments, following their guide, compiled the firmware, you know, from the GitHub clone and uploaded it just from there. And to do that, I had to use a um, JTAG connector to SWD. I used the STM32 F0 discovery board, um, disco board. Um, that is probably the cheapest option. Um, and as for the rest of the stuff that I'm going over, I'm generally going for the cheapest option as well as the easiest. So STM32 dis disco board with a custom soldered JTAG to SWD connector, which looks like this, this abomination right here. And using that, I programmed it just with the Linux development environment. Um, I had an issue where, let's see here, I had to enable virtualization in my computer's BIOS because of the way that the virtual machine runs I mean, I guess that makes sense. Virtual machine needs virtualization enabled. Um, that pretty much cleared up any issue that I had with that. Then from there, I was just able to upload it. Um, it's pretty much just a, just a matter of building the development environment, um, starting it up, then SSHing into it, just following the guide. I'll post a link to the guide for building the development environment and the compiling of the firmware. Then just from there, you plug in your, your disco board, connect it up to your module, 
connect up, connect your module up to power and then just do program. Like, well, you don't hit program, you type in a command. Um, but after that, that's pretty much it for firmware programming. Now, as for the connection between the disco board and the JTAG connector on the module, that's a little bit tricky. Um, I spent a little while trying to figure out exactly which pins connected to what, looking at the STM32 data sheets, kind of a waste of time, but I couldn't find anything existing on this, which is why I'm making this video. Um, and I'll maybe like put up a little graphic here or something as to what pins connect to what, or like a link in the description showing what pins connect to what from the cheap option, the disco board to the module. It's just a matter of figuring out what pin does what and connecting it up to the right place. Um, I would recommend getting a female JTAG connector, which is a 10 pin, like the fine pitch size uh, pin header, um, just so that you don't have to solder to the pin headers on the module because that's just a pain. Um, I had to do that twice because the first time that I messed up programming it. So get a pin header, um, get an extra one. Um, and to go along with that, moving on to another thing, um, make sure that you get a keyed power connector. Um, it's the smaller 10 pin, five pins, two rows. Um, make sure that you get a keyed one. The, uh, the parts list that I've seen floating around, they are just two ten two five pin headers um, without the kind of like the case around it um, which means that you can plug in the power backwards just like that like kill your hours and hours of work not to mention all the money they've put into it get a key power connector it's important um, also don't forget your power cables i didn't have one so i had to rig something up for the first time that i plugged it in um, so just remember to order one as you're building this. Although if you have extras laying around, just don't bother with that. And as for the pin headers, make sure you put them on the right side. Um, experience <laughs> tells me that um, these pin headers are kind of difficult to unsolder because the entire board has a fairly large like ground plane that the pin headers connect to. And that means that as you're soldering to them, it sucks all the heat away from your soldering iron, making it really difficult to unsolder stuff. Um, that's also part of when you're assembling it, if one side of your component seems like it's extra difficult to solder, that's why, because it's a uh, resistor or capacitor going to ground, and that's just sucking all the heat away from your iron. Maybe that's just because I have a weak iron, although I'm using a TS-100, which I don't think that should be an issue. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that you're watching out for that, making sure you're not getting cold solder joins. Um, drag soldering is great and use flux. Use um, This is a flux pen for reflowing some stuff as well as get flux in a syringe like this. This is just, it says it's no clean, that's a lie. Um, but you can get this on just Amazon or wherever you get solder supplies from. Use it. It is extremely important for soldering the ICs. Um, you will not be able to solder the really fine pitch STM32 as well as some of the other stuff without flux. Um, and if you're not familiar with drag soldering, um, I'll maybe put a link or like a card up somewhere about that and how you do that. Um, it's, it's great. It makes stuff like this possible. Um, without like a reflow oven or something. As for the front panel, um, I'm still kind of getting there with mine. Um, it currently has a laser cut acrylic front panel, um, which didn't turn out that great. Um, the laser cutter that I was using wasn't like super well calibrated um, or it just had an issue with one of the axes and it just kind of turned out a little bit rough, um, not the best but it's usable for now. Um, I might recommend if you care about how your module looks, um, getting a pre-built just aluminum front panel from like Module Addict or wherever sells them. Um, you can get front panels for this, um, although that will boost your cost up a significant amount. Um, I think the ones that I've seen are like $30 or something like that. So if you're trying to do this for cheap, something to consider um, if you have access to a laser cutter, acrylic is really cheap, aluminum isn't, 
Um, so that's what I went for for this. I'll probably recut it from acrylic once I get a chance, maybe get some black acrylic instead of clear acrylic and make those markings just a little bit more visible and get the cut just a little bit more on on spot. Um, you can see, I'll get a close up here. I think the um, clear front panel is a neat look, um, especially when it lights up. Um, that's for you to decide. Um, I don't know that you can see, but some of those markings are just a little bit blurry, especially around the um, outputs and around that volt per octave marking. Looks a little bit rough. Um, something you consider is, you know, your laser cutting settings. And at this point, this is not really super relevant to building the module. Just something I worked with when building this. Well, that's pretty much it for my overview of the information on how to build this module. It is not something to be afraid of. Um, it was actually a whole lot of fun, minus the few annoyances. And I'm hoping that this video, if you're finding this before you've started building it, can help you out making it not an annoying experience and instead one that can go just really smoothly. And hopefully you can learn from my mistakes, stuff that I messed up, stuff that I forgot, um, or stuff I just had to figure out myself. Um, as I said, a bunch of resources will be down in the description of information about this, information about the module, links to resources I found. There's a Muff Wiggler thread on this build, um, which has some useful information. It directed me to some useful spots, but I'm hoping that this video can just be kind of like a condensation of all that information um, to a useful format for people to use. And I'll probably post this on uh, Muff Wiggler and I'll probably post this on Muffwiggler somewhere. Um, maybe it's under under its own thread and maybe on that thread. And if you're seeing it there, then I guess I did. Um, but I guess that's it um, for now. Um, hit subscribe, like, whatever, the standard stuff. Um, that's it. Thanks.